Bé, bona tarda. So, good afternoon, good evening. We will now start the last panel of this day, which is from the local to the global perspective, lesbians in Catalonia. I will be facilitating this panel and basically I will now introduce the panelists. And I'm happy because we are all women. So I will introduce them and their trajectories. We've got to the left Marce Otero Vidal. She has a degree in uh, philosophy and philology here uh, with a chair in Latin at this university. She's also a feminist activist. She's currently doing great work at Caladona and the feminist network and uh, other feminist organizations like Boyos in Teoria. And uh, she's doing a great job in Catalonia. Uh, also, um, she's also a translator and uh, literary editor, and she's a member of the National Council LGTBI of Catalonia. We also have Maria Pia. She's a feminist activist as well. She fights for the rights of women and lesbians, bisexuals, and trans. She's a counselor, spokeswoman of Esquerra Republicana de Catalunya, left-wing party at the Horta Guinardó district of Barcelona. And then we have Maria Giral to my left. She's a historic activist. She organized the first lesbian collective in Spain. The, uh, and she's a member of the Front de Liberament Gay de Catalunya the um, Gay Liberation Front of Catalonia. She uh, joined the uh, feminist movement afterwards, and she she's uh, promoted the lesbian networking, El Cruz, and El Gender and LGBT Lab, where she's uh, working currently at Gaylas TV. And uh, she's also, uh, they also prepare the Aliquales report, which is a annual report. She's the vice president of the LGTBI chamber and director of El País uh, of the Pride Social Barcelona. I'm the president of the family, uh, the organization Families uh, LGTBI and LGTBI.cat. And I will facilitate in the panel asking questions to the panelists and uh, facilitating this panel, which will not be a set of presentations. I will just ask to ask you to just uh, take the floor and say your piece uh, on account of the uh, questions. And then if there's anything else you want to say, please do so. First question from me is what has been your path, your trajectory as women with dissident sexualities? Just to set the environment, the, the context, the starting point. Good evening. Um, I believe I should start because my age. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for the invitation, and I would like to thank you for being here with us sharing this evening. I was here at this university for 20 years, from 1964 to 1984. Uh, and I never had anything about lesbians or gays or anything like that. I mean, I had some things, but uh, nothing like that. I mean, you don't want to know what was the environment of the university on those gray years of, uh, the, of the dictatorship. First time someone publicly spoke about lesbianism in this university and the law of social danger and so on was in the first sessions of uh, women in 1966, last week of May, and it was like the starting point of the feminist movement after the dictatorship. That was in 1976. And uh, we know there was uh, feminism here before that. We perfectly knew who were the women from Feminal, 
Carmacal, Dolors Monserda. I mean, we we've been keeping track of them. It wasn't easy, but uh, we had the militias, the women from 36. But when we got there, we didn't really know about that because, uh, again, no one would ever speak about that. And I'm saying this because when they ask, what's your background, I should start saying that. Somehow, my conscience and uh, the awareness of feminine sexuality and its multiple manifestations up to 1976 we didn't really know anything so that's why I have always fought for uh, sexual effective training in schools and everywhere so from that point on when these awareness started to raise and to appear you know today we they, they talk about intersectionality like women and lesbians well then feminist lesbians lesbian feminist and we've kept on walking from there so that's just a starting point because I'm here I would also like to share a memory uh, or a remembrance of all the uh, colleagues uh, male and female colleagues that have been here in any imaginable closet in this university I would like to see them here sitting here with us because we've gone through rough times and maybe now would be a nice time for celebration. I guess I should continue. Uh, since I was 14, I've known I like women. I didn't know about the word dissident, but yes, I guess I'm dissident since I was 14. And uh, because I wanted to be normal, I started studying psychology when I was 17. Sí, perfecta. Y aleshores, hola. Sí. So, I started studying the, uh, well, psychology to understand what everything was about, and by chance, I might not be here otherwise, and they were holding this presentation of the Gay Liberation Front of Catalonia. That was at the School of Psychology when it was located next to the uh, Barcelona Football Stadium at the university campus it was crowded it was a there was a huge crowd there and at the end of the presentation i went to the table and i asked whether they had women in the organization too but they said well they gave me this uh dna for the, this sheet of paper you know with uh, all the text on it with 30 names and i started calling each one of them, out of these 30 people, I got in touch with 10, which is quite a high percentage out of those 10, well, these 10 people actually, these 10 women we met in Plaza Catalunya, where the FNAC store is now located, and that's where the first lesbian collective started within a gay organization. In this case, it was the Catalonia Liberation Front, FAC. So uh, we held meetings for a year or so with divergences and so on and disagreements and we ended up with Greta Lamann. She was a radical feminist. At that point the word radical had its original meaning which is going to the wood. Unfortunately now Lydia Falcon has uh, stolen the term. I do not agree with that but anyways we would meet at Carré Riareta number eight in Barcelona, and that's where everything started. And uh, all the way to the present day. I will not give the floor to Laura. Well, I am from a different generation, but I was in the closet for a long time as well. As a little girl, I remember I had girlfriends because there were no labels for us, so I would 
be with uh, girls and uh, boys and I thought it was bisexual but then when I grew older as a teenager I went back to the closet because of pressure and all the relationship I had uh, afterwards were with men but it didn't they didn't really work something told me it wasn't working and I did not have any reference when I was in high school I didn't meet any gay man or lesbian woman I'm from 1993 I could look younger but uh, Anyway, when I was uh, 20 something, I really got out of the closet. I fell in love with my best friend after 15 years together. And the truth is, at home, I've had a safe space where I could be myself. That's a privilege, and I know I'm fortunate because of that. But not, it's not the same thing socially. I have not had references, and I couldn't talk with colleagues and friends about that but then at some point all of my friends we all came out of the closet and we all we all teamed up also um, as a teenager I started finding a socialization um, spaces as a collective I don't know if it's very different but it's my experience anyway you can keep on speaking I can you know launch some um, questions now and then, but what encouraged you to make you visible as lesbians? Make yourself seen. Well, the thing is not that you make yourself seen, but for others to see you, to, you know, identify you as such. Even if you think that you just, uh, you just live your life and, and, and just go about your things without ex explicitly saying anything you know sometimes time because people are kind at least in uh, some uh, peer environment but that's what it that's what it is about so about this visibilization it just takes time and uh, it's like over time you eventually become the uh, big lesbian, the old lesbian, that's uh, kind of the title you get. And then, you know, for women, what's important, it's the feeling of belonging to a group and finding uh, help and support in your friends and your lovers and uh, set up organizations because lesbianism is an experience, is a way of life, it is a pleasure, it is a will, but it is also a policy. Particularly at some point and moment, you really need, need to go for that political option. And that is where organizations, for instance at Caladona, when the feminist lesbian group came up, with the magazine Trivades, or when the younger lesbians from the Violet Axis came up, well, from this, uh, you know, discussion, this uh, organizational shelter in which uh, we were all side by side, that's what encouraged us to make ourselves seen. Also, with this, uh, you know, this visibilization, which is always related to a political alternative, that something else is possible, that another world is possible, and a different way of seeing things. And about Greta Landman, from the documentation center of Caladona, we can't really believe how this woman, on her own got herself this very significant historic conscience and she would keep everything personal, impersonal, everything she could, like the napkins from the day she would go out for dinner. And all of that is important today. I mean, we're talking about history here and uh, having this reference point in time it's very significant because it's good to have significant. It's good to have reference points uh, amongst peers, 
at a certain point, but also recognizing, acknowledging this genealogy and for young lesbians to know they are not the first ones, they are the only ones, and they have all this uh, history, all this precious documentation, because it really explains a load of things, uh, for instance, about this stage, this uh, period, which is uh, so challenged and questioned now, which is the transition to democracy we had in this country. So based on these kind of documents, what we feminist call uh, and say that the private is public and it's political, we can really dig out a great deal of things. So that's the kind of visibilization we have, which is individual uh, on, on, on one regard, but it's also collective, it's also joint. And do you think that uh, historical fund, this uh, file you have, this archive, do you think it is disseminated enough? Well, it's based on uh, voluntary work, of course, and it, uh, it comes with a lot of work. Once you have the materials and the documentation all sorted out in boxes, that, that's quite a lot when everything is filed because we had this uh, unfitting archive with the whole meaning of of the uh, of the word because uh, everything was not fitted in boxes and, and because this file this archive was uh, not in order when compared to the tradition of notarial files and archives uh, you know uh, they put away all the wills and contracts, uh, the files and archives of social movements are a, of a different character completely. And some days ago it was the uh, World Day of Archives and there's a lot of talk on the importance of archives and the importance of, of uh, memory because people talk about identity and the memory and then everyone panics about Alzheimer's and uh, it's all together the same package and we are really aware of the value of what we've got in those file cabinets at Caladona. It's, uh, it's a true jewel but you really need to sort everything out. We also know that things on paper will only last for so long so everything should be digitized and so on. Actually we are so much an institution here that we request money from the institutions to digitize our archive. And I had to seize the opportunity. Well, it is important because the history of the LDTBI movement has been written by men. Very few people know, for instance, there was this character, Estornelle da Verdi, who was uh, really important in Cornwall. She was a lesbian, she was a performer, a singer, she would uh, also cross-dress. And she was arrested because she was uh, mistaken for a man and she said, are you not going to do anything? And that's where the riot started. Well, she actually punched a police officer as well, but anyway. That's when the whole thing started there, and she's never mentioned. I mean, they mention other people like Marsha and so on, but uh, La Verny, and she's got this uh, lovely name, Stormé de La Verny, but still, she's of often forgotten. <coughs> this is like the manifest we did from the lesbian collective. It's never mentioned. The f I mean, the manifest or the fact that the lesbian collective existed. Now, there's starting to be some talk about it, but even our partners in the movement have not really underlined it because it was uh, something uh, just about women. And I love them. I love my former colleagues at the, at the original uh, Catalonia Liberation Gay Front, Gay Liberation Front, but uh, you really need to express these things out. You really need to say, we've been here, we are here, we've been here for a long time and we'll keep on being here because our work is indispensable. Um, by the way, the manifest Maria is talking about is the one that was read in the uh, NISA 
theater in the uh, fall of 1977. We have it in our archive, so no worries. Actually, I came out of the closet thanks to politics and the fact of being able of generating safe space, safe spaces for even, for me it was uh, about finding out and discovering the associations and I felt empowered to come out of the closet. And uh, that's what I think too. When I started digging into history, nothing about bisexuals, but also when I would look for lesbians, I didn't find anything. And it's even now difficult to find things and this is something we need to do from many places, also for younger generations. My sister, for instance, she's 20, and I'm saying this on a positive note. Many people on, in, in her classroom are lesbians or bisexuals. They do not speak it out uh, because it's normal for them, but they know about this, uh, but they don't know about this whole history. They don't really know about how hard the struggle was to get to the point to where they are, and I believe that's important. I also believe that references are important. I'm here and I'm so happy to be surrounded by references such as you. And uh, thanks to the fact that I got into the world of associations, I've had you as references struggling and fighting and raising awareness. And I believe uh, there should be many more. I was talking about this with Barbara. There should be many more women just uh, raising up and, and speaking up and uh, we need to go through this visibilization process. Of course, in the beginning, you have to accept things yourself. At first, that was my process at least. I had to accept myself, not judging myself. Uh, I didn't want to be pigeon boxed anyway. It's not like you need to have this label, like you have this social need to put a label on yourself because otherwise, what are you going to tell people? And uh, in my case, I really needed to say it out to, to express myself and to come out of the closet because I had had many heterosexual relationships before that. And also the gender expression, we have not said this, but for instance, my uh, partner, she has this um, dyke, as you could say, uh, expression, uh, the way she, the, the image she sells out, but I don't, and I believe there's not much uh, talk about this, about the gender expression, and this could also have an impact on heterosexual women. You know, it's not like you're walking on the street and they call you, they call you a dyke and you're not. And uh, we need to make that visible because women, we are so diverse and uh, the gender expression we send out doesn't have to be a label. Well, in my case, for instance, I did come out of the closet but uh, to save myself from a situation of sexual harassment, you know, my bosses, they're very nice and whatever, but they wanted to, they, they were hinting at me and they were flirting with me. And I said, I'm sorry, but I like women. So that's the way, that's, that's how I came out of the closet. But um, from that point on, they started to talk to me as if I was a guy, like about their flirts and, and their dates and so on. And it's like, I don't really need to hear all of that. But anyway, in, uh, in my case, I don't think they were surprised, uh, but it was kind of a defense mechanism. But it wasn't uh, unintentionally. Going back to this uh, subalternate uh, vision, you were in the uh, beginning of the um, of the um, rays of uh, gay and lesbian movements. But why didn't you have why lesbians didn't have a, a more relevant role in the beginning? Well, actually, we were at the first uh, real transversal, like cross demonstration with gay people, lesbian people, trans people, feminist uh, students, uh, trade unionist, uh, neighbor association representatives, everyone was there. And people who would join us on the street, 4,500 people, which was a lot at that point, at, at that time. So why? Why did this happen? Well. It was actually 10 of us versus uh, 
100 men, uh, 10 le lesbian women. There were no uh, cross-dressers or trans. And then Gretel said, you will come to us. You will come to us because the struggle is the same, because we're all homosexual. You know, she would give us that giggle and she would say, uh, you will come to us. And we did eventually, yes, because there's some synergies, some uh, sexist, patriarchal synergies here that float and keep on flowing, unfortunately, amongst our gay colleagues. Uh, and it's like that. We experience that and society as a whole experiences it and gay couldn't be any different. And for instance, the signs of Nazario, which were beautiful, but his signs, you know, the sign for the Gay Liberation Front did not represent us because it was uh, too phallocentric. And they would say, like you, lesbians just have a small penis and some things like that because it was the Lacanian um, period when everyone would talk about Lacan and so on. So at the end, uh, in the end, uh, we just left. Uh, She's laughing because she knows what she said that to me, but uh, it's okay because it's a, there's a family. But anyway, we, we left this organization, this movement, and I believe that uh, they never forgot us. They never forgave us for that, uh, like Armando Florbia, for instance. Uh, she, he would never, he will never mention us. He never does, uh, and that's why I have to say it. But I really love them too, anyway. And uh, so, and I'm talking to Marseille here, we lesbians uh, found shelter in the feminist movement, right? Well, that's one of those issues, you know, the lesbophobia of the feminist movement. And some uh, colleagues here can talk about it better because they've worked on it. And sometimes you don't even realize it's one of those feelings, but it's true, however, that in order for the feminist movement to make progress, we needed to give a good face, we couldn't tear things down. It's like lesbians would think, we'll discuss this later, and this was always latent there in the background to this issue, this feeling that in pro abortion demonstrations uh, all feminist lesbians would be there and uh, instead when the uh, calls uh, the demonstrations were just for lesbians there were only the lesbians there so this is one of the feelings the feminist movement has uh, has uh, self analyzed uh, from the inside somehow And, uh, well, however, the uh, relationship has always existed. We have never, never broken that down. And the lesbians in the feminist uh, have always had a place in the feminist movement. And at least uh, that's the way I like to think it's been. Of course, it depends on the personal experience of everyone. Something that has been a little more difficult within the feminist movement, also for feminists, has been the intergenerational dialogue. You know, at some point you had this uh, lesbian, young lesbians pushing forward, and in this, uh, inside the group of feminist lesbians, they uh, prepared this document, which was presented in the uh, days in uh, Granada. It was called. Uh, the, this manifest was called the the uh, dress of the empress and uh, they were already criticizing the things uh, the way things were and of course it's never easy but I think that now at this point uh, we are quite content and um, grateful and all together just in case well much like here we know that there are some people that are drivers and facilitators and one of the most active groups 
is the known as Bollos in Teoria, which would be uh, theoretical dikes, kind of. And they, uh, they say, again, dikes, but theoretically, or dikes in theory. And there are discussions on every Saturday morning, and then we go over some things that we believe are very interesting, where some of us read through, let's say, ancient texts, where we read Monic Vitik's text, for instance, or on lesbians, whether they are women or not. So these type of topics, and, and some readings that are really powerful. Until you reach the present performance, you can, we go over this. So whenever they call for these, the day of pride, and well, I think that being a feminist lesbian is something that you can really be proud of. Yes, I am. Yeah, a week ago, I was rereading some manuscripts by Gretel, and they were so updated, indeed. They were so modern. I mean, you, you could research that, because she was looking at the way that other feminist groups were using the terms, and from psychology, from the, the mastery of language, I would say that that was really something very updated. Very, yeah, what Maria is saying and by Gretel is, is something that we really need to be well aware of, women, whether we're lesbians or not, in not trying to become a subject of research or the object of research. We want to be a subject because some topics become fashionable, and often, since they have not very, very much researched, then at the university level or whatever level, like it's like labor and women or healthcare and women. So you get my point. And this is something that Gretel already perceived. It, it's not like we lesbians can only talk about lesbianism. Um, it's not reaching that extreme, but we need to be aware in that it's not like you shall not name God in vain. Well, you shall not name lesbianism in vain either. Yes, it's true that when they say like healthcare and women or medicines and women, so meaning that medicine was in the hands of men back then, so language terminology is really perverted and that was something that Gretel really mastered along these lines what do, how do you think that we should relate or should establish links with other struggles for instance against racism or the struggle for care, the struggle for housing. What might be the role of lesbian women in this kind of, str of struggles? Well, at first, when we said that back in the demonstration in 1977, everyone came. It was like there was talk by Omnium Association on these shared struggles. Well, why not having these all in once more. But then this brings to my mind that famous intersection intersectionality. But that, that seems to be the last lesson because first we were going through cross sectionality, now we're talking about intersectionality. And it, it, the problem is that often these are just terms and that we are so fed up or being told about these, intersectionality, cross-culturality, or interculturality. But at the end of the day, how are we making things happen? What are we doing? And uh, l let me add another topic here. I I'm seeing, an, in, to some concern in my view, and um, how in the academia or in the university, in such a setting where we are now, how 
there is a line of discontinuity between the queer movement and the LGBT movement. Let, let me explain myself. As if the queer movement has just appeared, even though it was like 20, 30 years ago, and these contrasting, opposing the work being done from the LGBTI movement. So it, it, it's seen as something opposed, as something which is discontinuous. And I would think that this is dangerous, even more so when stemming from the academia. Gender studies, LGBTI studies. Uh, in Barcelona are taking place since 93, where the first comparison studies started off in 93 at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and then some years later here at the University of Barcelona. But there is uh, this discussion, which is not a discussion, rather it's more like a confrontation, and I would say it's dangerous in that when this pours out into the society, people read it the way they do and they end up by having this reductionism approach and finding young people that identify themselves as queer and well, I mean uh, that's great because we're all queer we're all dissident no matter our age but they are against the pride day and so uh, I, I, I mean I'm the director of the Pride now, maybe I will not be in some years' time, but, but again, in, I'm a bit, I think it's a bit of a pity to see these, and I think that this shows some lack of accountability by the academia in conveying this sense of duality to the society, as if there were some bad guys and good guys. But what we are seeing now in Catalonia, in Spain, most of what we now have has been through the role of the trans, gay, families, lesbians, and it's after the after their struggle to make these laws possible. So to tear these down, well, Maybe we should start thinking what we are doing in the academia, in the university. But later we'll see how some political parties and, and some left-wing parties even, or ruling parties, that look at this queer part, this younger part, and they promote it in a way as if to have a negative impact on the usual LGBTI movements, because it leaves them just plain naked out in the wild. Um, and and uh, no one's daring saying what I'm saying out here. But uh, anyway, maybe because I have my age, but I think we need to make this clear. And probably I'm sure that this is done in all good faith and no, no doubts on that. But we should read Judith Butler some more. She's a wise person. She's telling us that in the times we are, where, where this is related to on, on our planet, on, our, on the water, on the forest, and what are we to do with the seas? <laughs> Solidarity. Judith Butler says that we have to be caring, we have to be supportive. It doesn't mean that we need to love to one another or to lay in bed to one another, but we need to know where our enemy is. And that's very simple to understand. And it's the enemy is not amongst us, is outside. So uh, anyway, without taking up more time, just wanted to make this point. Well, on that, um, from a different generation, I think that we should try to run away from fads and that often, and I can tell you because I'm very much into social media and then all of a sudden you see these new naming, new labeling, and sometimes these uh, detracts from the movement. I mean, I've been in training in these communities and 
what people say, why labeling yourselves? And then you go into this naming thing and this labeling part. And maybe what you are now talking about, it's because, I mean, as a teenager myself, I did not know about the uh, history of the LGBTQ movement. And sure, there are some young people that are very much attracted to it, that maybe too much, and maybe they have this lack of sense of belonging, and maybe this eventually is uh, sort of a, a, a fad to them. But it's also, in my view, because they are lacking the true awareness on what's been done, and they would like to believe in a utopia and that where you need no labeling, where you need no tagging, not saying that that might not be the future, but maybe now it is not so. Well, but maybe we should start by reading Judith Butler and discussing us all amongst us, and we need to do that because I don't think it's just a fashion. I don't think it's just a fad. Or I think it's more like a natural evolution in the movement back in '77 where we were together. But things are changing now, and bringing in new acronyms, new letters, and we have the intersex. Well, they didn't want to be there, but here we have them. So anyway, it's non. Binarism, it's here that we have non binary people. Judith Butler herself, she claims not to be, she claims to be non binary, but that was something that was not um, here some 20 years ago. Well, now you can be non binary. I, I don't think it's just a fad as such, but maybe trends and the, the issue is on if you. And then this is something that you can see in the social media, and I would say mostly in Twitter. I know what happens with people on Twitter. They go crazy, and they can ruin your life if you say something like we have expressed here, just a fraction of it, you would be brought to the gallows and by, the, by an angry mob. Then, so people refrain from stating their views. Apparently, we're in a society where we, this is a free society, not like in Franco's regime, but now we are more coarse than ever. We don't seem to uh, reflect on things. We take many things for granted, and people just follow their some motives. So, if you are a left-minded person, you need to work for a true democracy, and that can only be provided by education, by training. And I think it's crucial and it's very important because otherwise the rest just wouldn't work. Let, let me go back to, because I know you kind of digress onto many topics, but let me ask you a thing. And this is a question for the three of you. If any, which have been the major claims by lesbian? Well, uh, one of the major claims, one of the major things that we have vindicated is the ownership the, of our own body. And that's you know, the, the, what they say, the agenda. And that would be like one thing would be the same-sex marriage. And that was one of the milestones. And we, and a group of feminist lesbians, we believe that marriage were still in patriarchy that would strengthen patriarchy. Another milestone. Like we lesbians should have children, should have the possibility of having children. That was another milestone. And for lesbians to be able to have their children with the family names of both mothers. So there have been some stepping stones, some milestones that were clear in the agendas. But again, these are just the tips of the iceberg. 
and then you have what's beneath the surface. And again, as Maria was saying, like, how are we to approach education? How are we to approach co-education? What are we to do if there is no sexual effective education at schools? What if you still face this sexist kind of bullying? So one thing are the claims that can be put in the agenda, sort of, and then a different thing would be that we will always be lacking some more. There is some room to go. And we need this proper recognition of, of history. When Maria was talking about queer, like, for instance, when they come to research, one asks, and they come to look for queer material, well, and we say we don't have queer material because back in the 70s or 80s we had none and so they look at to the documents or the materials of the 70s and 80s and they say well this is queer so because when you were saying this that, that's something that stuck in my mind in what attack is what a label is and what a reality is yes because in the United States for instance I mean, like, queer, we're all queer in that we're all outcasts, we are all different. Yeah, yeah sorry, I went back in time, and um, Cathy's question was different, <laughs> but then I'm slow-minded, so I had this stuck in my mind. Well, as on what Cathy was asking, I think that this invisibility of lesbian women is just a myth, just a legend, because we can be found everywhere. I mean, really, everywhere. We are at the cashier's desk, at the supermarket, we are teachers, we're, and last week a document uh, um, a festival done on every five years in Castle the most prestigious art show and the group in charge of all the documents is a group of five lesbian women in the Basque country. They do not, well people do not know that they are lesbians, I mean they are not seen as a role model but here you have them, or teachers. There are many teachers who are lesbians and so we're everywhere, but then we have not made ourselves so visible in the LGBTQ movement because we have this dual uh, as ceiling as lesbians and as women, then we seem to sip down the cracks and that's where you can find us. So you're saying that we are facing this dual ceiling as lesbian women, even though you were at the front, at the gay liberation front, it was more difficult to you as lesbian women, but that not just something that they men would understand because they wanted to promote that back then. And we had to kind of uh, tell them and doing this work in a more silent way. Yes, indeed, and many lesbian women that would not dare saying they were so, they found in feminism the right, the ideal showcase to be there without expressing themselves as lesbian, but rather as feminists uh, to prevent this dual stigma. Yes, yes. Well, in my generation, one of the thing there is much talk about are the anticonceptive methods. The men seem to have quite much, and we don't have that much, and we are also not that much protected against STDs. It's not like a condom, and this is a topic that's not been much discussed. And whenever we have sexual relationships among women, we have very many doubts and for the younger people I think that this is something that should be promoted and researched and furthermore is really expensive I'm saying so because now 
and the pride uh, we under the motto boy your mommy the mommy dyke so we've had to buy some of these which are really expensive methods and I'm not sure how much a condom is I don't have any idea but I would think that ours are like four times more expensive and so and they are unknown to many in like if you do not know how you can protect yourself and you do not know how to use it, how to employ it. Yeah, um, many people find it hard to understand lesbian women in like, if there is no penis, it's like there is no sex, no sexuality, which is not true, because when a woman try, tries being with another woman, there is no coming back. <laughs> Someone had to say it. So, if there is no sexuality, less STDs. It's that latex thing, but it's really expensive. I mean, or even for menstruation, for the menses, we are having these many issues. when talking about the price of uh, not just antiseptives but on tampons for instance we're also facing this issue in that we don't have the true justice on taxes now but, but uh, should we talk about these or about lesbians maybe we are digressing a bit too much well i have a trend in me so, do you think that we now are occupying a more prominent position in like the, there are some lesbian groups, which ones have stood the test of time, which ones have remained? Well, I was a member of an organization, the Observatory Against Homophobia, I'm no longer a member, but I was looking for a place where I could socialize and to stand for our rights, but there were no women there. And so I think that we still find it hard to find a spot uh, within the collective. And in many areas that we find it hard. We find it hard to empower ourselves, to really own it. And we are vice presidents rather than presidents. And we find it hard to find these and to be a true part. And now I'm at Boyos in Teoria, this association, and I'm more into it because I, but at first I was looking for an LBT organization and it was really difficult for me. And I went to Lesbicat, got no answer from them, and eventually I ended up at the observatory against homophobia, but we seem to be lacking networking, socializing spaces. Well, maybe these are spaces that we should be creating rather than trying and find them where when they already have a really laid out sexist structure in that and, and, and they are our colleagues in these organizations. But the truth is that the, like the pride, for instance, when all organizations are there, the LGBT, well, you find Cathy as the president of the LGBT families, but then since 80%, 80% are members, so it has to be a woman, and then vice president has to be a man. And then Ana Valenzuela from Crisales. So the thing that we have told them this year is to have women, lesbian women in the in these associations and they should be the ones that come up to the stage maybe this year or in future years because it, it it's a clear picture it's men all around and just a single woman and then myself on these spaces for lesbian women 
now since since we have Maria Giral here we have not mentioned Daniels because when you look back in history you also need to go through these short stories that have so are more powerful than one might think yes Dan Daniels was a pub in San Gervasi district it was a lesbian pub and I was great Amparo she was a patron there and I was for 10 months working every day it was open seven days a week and it was great it was an outstanding place which it still was there because it, it's really it was really difficult to believe you would find your housewives the early hours in the morning or the students with their uniforms and then late at night you would get the actresses I cannot give you names here because some of them are still alive but the people from El Molino Music Hall they, you would find models it was like your usual British pub oh, uh, way cleaner and then you would have Daniela organizing uh, performances and basketball matches and then I was um, on the music and there was a red light as the warning sign so that you would see that in the dance floor uh, so that people would stop dancing in in the event of a police raid it was quite an experience when talking about spaces and places that we should be one must think that there have been some precedents uh, so then you would have Rosa as well, Patmos, members, yep. Anyway, that's an old women's story. But anyway, these are places that have existed and sooner or later someone will have to write about them. But that was what the underground movement had. This, it has these attractiveness this sexy aspect of what's being forbidden and it was like a great family people from all over catalonia and even from abroad coming it was always crowded uh, there's a smoky pub and many stories tucked in there and it was like a family wasn't it emperor No, 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 uh, but since we are in a place of uh, history, well, it's good to look at these milestones to these feeds, and I think it's worth remembering, because the thing is, um, activism, and then a, a different thing would be all these spaces for sharing, for leisuring, for entertaining, for well-being, and... I think that it's an important thing bearing in mind. Yeah, we need to reinvent ourselves again and again. Some years ago in 2013, for four years, along with some of my friends and partners, we organized some lesbian cruisers in the Mediterranean. And people from Peru would come. Some couples from Peru would come for this cruiser and just to be there, I was amazing. And so new ways of organizing ourselves. Maybe what's already here is no longer useful. And then we have to do that on our own. It, we shouldn't be sitting back and waiting for someone else to do that for us. Yes, and I agree with what you're saying that it's up to us. No one else will do it for us. And to conclude, before we open the floor for questions, maybe you can tell us if there is some self-criticism that can be thrown on the job done by lesbian women since 1977. Well, I learned here at the university that uh, in the, when we were in clandestinity that if you 
if you request that um, acquittal in a in a trial, then you could be executed. So you had to accept your accusations, your charges, because otherwise they would put on you so much more. You know, it's like the self-criticism. It's better to request absolution. And and uh, we've done things right, things wrong, but we've tried. That's for sure. And that's really important, having tried. And of course, today, I see here people from the institutions. We need to bear in mind that there's a number of laws. We know the limits of laws. We feminists know the limits of laws. Uh, that's what we've been discussing about glass ceilings and so on. But uh, of course, uh, thank God we've got the laws. They could be better? Yes, definitely, because some of them were rushed at the end of a mandate because uh, we didn't know if we would be able to do it in the next power cycle. But we've done that. We've done that. Uh, at least they're done. And um, to the extent we are women that are aware and responsible, we assume responsibilities. Well, of course, full-on self-criticism. We need self-criticism. We need to criticize ourselves and the movement as a whole, ways we relate to each other, the way we organize ourselves. We need to work together. But that doesn't mean uh, that doesn't mean we need to, you know, um, sleep together. But we need to go in the same direction. Self-criticism for lesbians as well means not wanting to be in the spotlight also maybe because we women we don't like to you know speak in public but i have to do it because i have the moral obligation of doing it and so these this relaxation this uh, let someone else speak let them speak the men well this visibility we were talking about uh, this lack of visibility is sometimes on us and no one else but us so we need to empower ourselves because we are powerful we are lesbians we know what the world what the word lesbian means we are amazons i'm sorry but we are continuously fighting we fought since we were little not so little some of us but normally since we were little and we've gone against everything in society and this is why we are self-made we are free people because we never had to depend uh, financially on a husband of course I'm I'm uh, generalizing here but uh, this uh, power we need to be able to convey it, to occupy the space public space mainly because we have private spaces but we also want public spaces and we need to take them up but in terms of self-criticism, I would say we must not forget. We need to always remember things, uh, how hard it was to get to this point, and we can lose it all overnight with the far right the way it is. And sometimes it's difficult to be aware of that. And also sorority, it's what you said, Maria. We need to understand what sorority means. And sometimes if we don't think we don't do things together then others will go ahead of us uh, and of course I like to say that history has made us invisible and we have to write history so that we are seen in history and that would be also the criticism from a generational point of view and also to reinforce what I just said there's no difference between the LGTBI movement and the queer movement they're all one and the same we complement each other and the queer theory reinforces everything around LGTBI so there's no gap between one thing and the other as sometimes wants to be uh, some people want to want to um, understand from the academia so we shouldn't divide there's this 
trend, uh, this tendency to, to divide, to split up also with political interest behind sometimes. But no, we are together on these issues and others. We are together and we stand together. We need to work together. And Okay, so we will now move on to the Q&A session. If anyone wants to raise a question. Well, thank you all of you for your words. Uh, and uh, well, now uh, about the celebration of the Pride Barcelona. I recently found out, and I'm just uh, speaking from memory, but I found out I discovered the Boston marriages I didn't know about, Wesley marriages. This was an institution which was uh, completely accepted in the north of the United States by which two women could live in a marriage for financial purposes. And uh, this was accepted for two women to live in this sexual effective relationship. I also read the works of uh, García Daudés on the topic. He had two hypotheses. One, that there was more tolerance towards these things at that point, and that disappeared in the beginning of the 20th century. The second one is that no one would think that two women who lived together could have a different purpose than a financial one, because women did not have any sexual desire. So I would like to know what's the role in your memory, in your genealogy of this institution, of the uh, Boston marriages, and also sometimes we should go back to 1889 with when James Adams and the 18th start opened this uh, community of women where women were living in marriages in Boston, and this was accepted also in Chicago and the whole area. So. I know this is a specific question, but I don't know. I would like to know if you have this uh, part of the genealogy also integrated as a way of living in freedom. Well, we should go back to Safas. Um, she was uh, the uh, most prominent poet, female poet ever. But uh, because she was a lesbian, she's been left aside, but she was as important as Homer. But uh, yes, there's been the um, Boston marriages, and there's always been ways of uh, sneaking through the cracks, and uh, there's been many uh, Catalan female writers who were lesbians, and uh, they've been living with their assistance or whatever this has exist, existed forever there's no origin and the I mean it's not the 18th century or the 19th century it has existed always the history of Alistair in Victorian England uh, she uh, also was able to live with her with her partner and if we were to go and find the origins we would have to date to go to go really back in time. Yes, obviously, from a historic perspective, uh, when you look for a genealogy, we see we've, we're not the first, we're not the only ones, and uh, you go back to the beginning of time if you go back in time, and that's what also provides us with this empowerment, this whole genealogy we have on our backs, and if they made it, we'll, we will make it as well. And there are cases which are really moving also in a literary way, because what we keep, what has prevailed this literature, and uh, we've not discussed this, but the, you know, the role of lesbians in literature to break down stereotypes, uh, that that would be a whole other topic, but yes, um, I like your point. Yes, hello. I would basically want to confirm what Maria said at this point, and also related to what you said about the movement. 
there's been a part of the movement that did not feel related uh, to the uh, legal acknowledgments there has been. So we were socially excluded in the movement. You could be wealthy or poor, a uh, woman, a lesbian, a gay man, whatever. But when you could be acknowledged uh, in a marriage and also your properties and your condition would not influence but not impacting your life then you had the option of going against the system now you had to i mean in the past you had to go against the system wanted or not but i believe that a part of the movement is now missing that or they, or they had not they have not assumed it they've not accepted it so these kind of contradictions which are very dynamic in the collective we really need to be alert and we need to be united in difference and that's really hard to do and also we need to avoid fifth columns and this is nothing new but for 10 years at a european level i remember the pin for twin there's a phenomenon that was in the netherlands in which uh, lesbian and gay organizations were confronted with the islamic movement to uh, you know looking for a division for a divide so you know, Stonewall would have never existed without the feminist movement. So these links, these relations are our power, our strength, and we need to prevent this fifth column, this uh, division that's uh, instilled inside of the movement. And that's difficult for to understand for many people, but we, it really is life or death issue for us. And, uh, you know, union indifference is what makes us strong. And I give you a reference here, Jordi Patit. Good evening. I would just like to thank you for everything you, you've you taught us. Yeah, you know, lesbians from Greta Landman, also Ampar Pineda, and also the practice we had with the gay lesbian coordinator with the Lesbos movement uh, who told us we want to hold parties but on our own, just our just us lesbians. And why? Because if uh, in school anyone starts to bully us, we will feel uncomfortable. And also, men, like it or not, you take the initiative, you decide, you turn on the light, you turn on the light, you play that music or the other. So mixed work with gay men in activism has taught us many things we might have not learned outside of the activism world. I was actually surprised from uh, with what happens in Scandinavian countries, in uh, Norway, in Denmark, Sweden, and they have mixed associations since the 60s. And once a year, women have this assembly on their own and this uh, assembly aside they decide a number of things and they and then they go on with mixed work i know from scandinavia to the mediterranean uh, that's quite a stretch but i believe that mixed work has allowed us to learn a great many things uh, to, to men as uh, gay men and as men because we've received uh, sexist education of course well, probably in the Scandinavian countries they come from a different culture and probably here you know male sexism was more powerful that's maybe the explanation but we should analyze it thank you Jordi because you are a very prominent person in this uh, world in this field and thank you also for being with us here today Well, I think lesbians have always been kind of a hinge between the LGTBI movement and the feminist movement. And as a hinge, sometimes we've lost track of being lesbians. I don't know what you think about this, but uh, Maria, when, when you were talking about menstrual cups, 
we have this, uh, you know, we have this tendency to discuss anything but ourselves, and we have this tendency to fight within the LGBTQ plus movement and the feminist movement. And on this dual facet in which we feel comfortable and we work very well, we re it's really hard for us to talk about ourselves, you know, to focus the topic on ourselves and to really talk from ourselves. So I believe this is probably the task, the, the, the main task lesbians should focus on without losing sight or uh, without uh, stopping uh, the activism in the feminist movement or the LGBTQ movement, but we need some uh, inner work uh, from the outside to the inside and the other way around as lesbians. I would like to know whether you've got any strategy when you are in some place and you see that you start to digress because we have this ability. Uh, any strategy to refocus? We are working on that strategy indeed. Well, I love that you said this. I thought this idea would not come up, but I've always had this feeling that as lesbians, we are always working for others. And it's like, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's going to be our turn? And this is why we wanted to do this work. But again, that's work in progress. Yes, we like mothers, right? We're always taking care of someone. Okay, so we'll um, take a round of questions now, and then you can answer them all together to close up. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on this um, conference and this uh, session, because I believe what you do is really useful today. And I would like to highlight a couple of things. First of all, the lack of references, uh, reference people in this country, not just at the level of the media, but also its person who is a part of the uh, who is a part of the uh, LGBTI movement could be a role model for their friends, for their peers, when publishing a paper or a, a story on the newspaper or whatever. We need to break that barrier. Also, the second thing would be the difficulty to find spaces, to find places for the LGBTI collective. So, as I said, the lack of spaces to find people, you know, there's many meeting spaces for heterosexuals, but not so much for LGTBI, members of the LGTBI community, at least uh, from my experience. And then there was one last point which I forgot. Yes, visibility. Visibility on the, uh, in the media. Uh, there is a lot of talk on uh, aggressions suffered by gays or lesbians on the beach or on the street. But I believe that not enough work is done in this regard. And of course, I could answer this, uh, but it would be biased. I would like to ask you, what can anyone do, like me or any of us, to better disseminate and raise awareness on the LGBTI community? Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry to, to speak again. But I, just, I would just like to highlight something which is uh, the most transgressive part of the LGBTI community to lesbians, and this would be lesbian motherhood. You know, motherhood between two women, I believe that really upends the whole patriarchal 
sexist system, and I believe that's a huge contribution to make visible diversity. Lesbian motherhood, lesbian maternity is a great contribution which came when you could make it possible, and I believe this is the uh, avant-garde of the movement. Single parent um, families and particularly lesbian mothers. Yes, linking it to the um, you know places for socialization and partying and pleasure. Have you found in cities this uh, freedom space, or you could have to you had to look elsewhere because it just was you stop by gay men. Well, you now started asking about spaces, uh, like party places. I mean, we're not like a guide here, a book, a guide book. I don't really know what the best party places for lesbians. Anyway, as uh, we as lesbians, and this is the motive for the panel, we found places uh, all together amongst friends. Uh, it's difficult, but we are ordinary people and like anyone you always look for the spaces uh, that are more akin to you also someone was talking about spaces and small towns and so on well I know about these women for instance, they bought this house in the Maresme region and uh, they went to live by the sea as, uh, in their old age. Uh, some others uh, do different things, like they live in a commune. They, they used to do that when they were younger, and now maybe they do it again because if they had to go to a uh, nursing home, well, that's not a place where they feel comfortable. It makes sense because maybe they're not too old. Well, just uh, linking this last question to the comment by Jordi Batit, lesbians who want to have children want to be mothers and share it or not with uh, their lesbian partners, they find they do not fit in the heterosexual world or in the, in the lesbian environment they were enjoying before having kids if they're friends do not have kids, so they come to our organizations such as ours to find spaces where they can be relaxed amongst lesbians with children. So we basically look for this support networks, that's what, we've, that's what we have always done. So if you're younger you go to the members or if you are older and you can have children, you try and find other spaces, you go to Sparks with your lesbian mother friends. And uh, another topic, traveling. We lesbians love traveling. You know, you can go, it's like when you travel across the world and you find another Catalan. Well, you travel across the world and you find other lesbians too. Why? Because we love traveling and we love, you know, knowing about other cultures. I mean, you, you didn't find this, uh, like you go to, uh, you know, across the world and you find the Catalan there. Well, same thing, we are everywhere. And, uh, you know, lesbians like to travel. It's like, uh, we like to be like Thelma and Louis, but without the ending, different ending. We don't really know the ending of the movie, right? But anyway, we like to travel and travel differently and we can invent different things, we need to be creative, we need to, you know, like uh, exchange houses in Australia or Portugal or the state exchanging houses, whatever. Why not?
Okay, if there are no further questions, we would just close this panel. Thank you so much for being here. Hopefully, we will be able to, uh, you know, um, meet up again in the future, hopefully every year. Thank you so much.